we'll get started. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks for uh, coming out uh, for what I think is going to be a, a very interesting, uh, more theoretical than uh, you know practitioner type focused uh, discussion today. Uh, I'm Todd Harrison. I'm managing director of Matreya Strategic Insights. Uh, pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm going to be opening up in a, a second, uh, presenting some of the highlights from a, a paper that I, I published uh, as part of the research symposium. Uh, I'm, let me go ahead and introduce the other panelists here. Um, and so to my immediate left here is JJ Snow. Uh, she's operating partner at Matreya Discovery Partners. Uh, so full disclosure, uh, our two organizations, as you can probably guessed by the name, we're part of the same parent organization. Uh, she's also a former Air Force officer, was Chief Technology and Innovation Officer at AFWorks, uh, I believe your last assignment uh, before you left the service. Uh, and also, I looked up, you're an NPS alum, I am. correct? Okay, so you're, you're not new to Monterey. Um, uh, next uh, down the row here, uh, Jackie Schneider. She's a fellow at the Hoover Institution and director of the Hoover War Gaming and Crisis Simulation Initiative. Uh, she's also an affiliate at Stanford Center for International Security and Cooperation uh, and previously was an assistant professor at the Naval War College uh, and a senior policy advisor to the Cyberspace Solarium Commission. Uh, next down the row, I, I've got to look at my order here uh, and people. Uh, next is uh, Dr. Derek Tournier. Uh, he is director of the Space Development Agency uh, and the founding director since it was created in 2019. Um, uh, in way of introduction, I'm just going to say that I always tell people in Washington, um, real authority is budget authority. Uh, and the Space Development Agency, uh, it has grown tremendously from just uh, tens of millions of dollars in the annual budget request. In the most recent budget request, I believe it's 4.6 billion for FY24 and 20.2 billion over the FIDEP, uh, just for the Space Development Agency uh, that Derek uh, directs. Uh, so pleasure to have him here today as well. And uh, down at the end of the table, uh, Mandy Vaughn, uh, who is CEO of GXO Incorporated. Uh, she was previously president of Vox Space, which is the U.S. subsidiary of Virgin Orbit. Uh, she's a member of the Defense Science Board, uh, the uh, National Space Council Users Advisory Group. Uh, and Mandy uh, also began her career uh, as an Air Force officer working on space systems that I probably can't say too much about. Uh, and, and Mandy and I actually went to college together uh, and we're in uh, ROTC together. Uh, you know, she did something productive with her life uh, and, and then I just went into the think tank world. Um, all right, so why don't I go ahead and get started here. And uh, I'm gonna just, you know, give a brief overview of the paper and the kind of things I focused on. What I wanted to do in this paper uh, was really uh, address the core que question at the bottom of this slide. Uh, and you know that is we see a lot of emphasis placed on the idea of finding and leveraging asymmetric advantages. We see it uh, in the most recent national defense strategy. I've pulled out a few quotes here that talk about uh, how we can use uh, asymmetric advantages. Uh, also, if you look at uh, USD r and es technology vision uh, for an era competition, uh, that was published not too long ago, uh, it also calls out as one of its key pillars uh, for its technology strategy is that we want to maximize our asymmetric advantages and lots of different ways that we can do that. But, you know, the question that naturally follows after that is, okay, how can we, eval how can we evaluate, how can we identify and evaluate uh, the asymmetric advantages that have the greatest potential? the greatest potential to endure, to actually last, uh, and the greatest potential to give us maximum leverage. Uh, and then how can we apply that within our defense acquisition programs uh, in general? So like a lot of things, I, I, I like to go to first principles first. Uh, and so here's a horribly ugly picture, um, but this is something that I didn't realize, maybe you know, folks who are marine biologists would realize what this is. This is a flounder. Uh, this is a peacock flounder, um, and boy, does it look ugly. You can see the mouth kind of there, but the eyes are very misshapen. It's a very asymmetric face. Um, and so what I wanted to do is start with looking at where do we find asymmetries in nature and what can that tell us, 
right? Uh, and so in nature, what we see is asymmetries tend to be derived from the fundamental forces in the universe uh, not acting uniformly in all directions, right? A good example of this is the electromagnetic force, right? The force it, it exerts depends on uh, whether it's a positive charge next to a positive charge or a positive charge next to a negative charge. Um, time itself is also asymmetric. It only goes in one direction. Uh, it may seem simple, but a lot of fundamental things derive from these uh, concepts, like the second law of thermodynamics, the fact that heat will spontaneously flow from hot to cold, but not the reverse, right? That all derives from the time asymmetry. Um, now, you know, at, at higher and higher levels uh, in the environment, you start to see, you know, life itself uh, is a function of asymmetry. I love this quote from Louis Pasteur here, uh, that life as manifested to us is a function of asymmetry. Uh, and indeed it is. And why do we see asymmetry so much uh, in, in different, you know, life forms? Uh, it's because it creates advantage, right? And these advantages are self uh, perpetuating. So we see it in asymmetric cell division, where cells will divide in a way that damage uh, within the cell. Misfolded proteins are biased towards one half uh, when it divides, and so there's a healthy half and a not so healthy half, right? Uh, and that is self-perpetuating. You see it in the flatfish. Uh, flounder is apparently part of the family uh, of fish known as flatfish. They are not born with both eyes on the same side of their head. <laughs> They're born with eyes on either side of their head. As they mature, one eye actually migrates over to the other side so that they can lay flat on the ocean floor and both eyes are pointed up looking for predators. Makes sense, right? That gives you an evolutionary advantage. Uh, that was something that even puzzled Charles uh, Darwin. He wrote about it uh, in Origin of the Species. Um, uh, and then, of course, the human brain itself, you know, you've probably all heard we have a left brain and a right brain. There's an asymmetric division of functions in our brains, but also the brain itself is asymmetric. Uh, if you look at pictures top down uh, of the human brain, it's not symmetric left to right. Uh, you see, you know, the front right, I think, extends a little more over towards the left, and the back left extends more towards the right. It looks like it's twisted from the bottom. Um, and, and that is because, that's one of the things that makes us uniquely human, uh, is that we do have that specialization and asymmetry in our brain. Now, bringing it a little closer to military uh, competition, uh, geography in nature uh, is highly asymmetric. Uh, I put a chart in the paper, you know, just showing some different geographic characteristics of nations to make the point that no two nations on Earth uh, are symmetric when it comes to geography. We all have different resources, different shapes, uh, different boundaries. Uh, and, you know, if I say, you know, you want to seize the high ground in military competition, most people understand that. That is fundamentally a geographic asymmetry that we're talking about. Uh, and these asymmetries we see in the geography among nations, that has direct effect on life, on human interactions, and in military conflict. Um, so ultimately, what you see from looking at asymmetries in nature is that these are the things that give us the ability to affect the environment around us, right? That is what makes things different and differentiable. Um, and asymmetries can work synergistically together, building in layers on top of one another uh, to be additive and in some cases uh, produce exponentiating uh, growth and advantage. Now, I then looked at, you know, what are some examples of asymmetries in military competition? I went through three examples uh, at the strategic level, operational level, and tactical level uh, of competition here. Um, the first, the new look, Eisenhower's new look at defense, which is now retroactively commonly referred to as the first offset strategy. Um, the idea there was that Soviet, the Soviet Union had a great advantage over us, numerical superiority in their conventional forces um, at, you know, at the end of the Korean War. Uh, so you know, the idea in the New York strategy was how can we offset that numerical advantage in conventional capabilities, uh, what they came up with is basically massive retaliation. We're going to use our advantage, our asymmetric advantage in nuclear weapons uh, to counter the quantitative uh, advantage of the Soviets and conventional forces. Uh, and it worked for a while. 
Uh, but eventually, we all know what happened. The Soviets, in not too many years, reached uh, rough parity with us in terms of nuclear weapons. Um, so that advantage did not last that long. It ended up creating a stable equilibrium, uh, so that was good. Uh, but then folks started to look for, okay, we need a different strategy. We need something that's more flexible. Enter flexible response. Um, but if you keep going forward to like the 1970s, um, that's when we started looking for a second offset strategy. Uh, and what came out of that is commonly referred to as, you know, the precision strike um, or precision guided, you know, munitions regime. Uh, and the idea there is that we could give, uh, you know, our forces, which were still numerically smaller than the Soviet forces, we could give them a qualitative advantage uh, through precision strike and advanced delivery systems and innovative concepts of operations of how we're going to use these things together. Uh, and that would allow us to counter the Soviets. Um, and, of course, you know, it did work. It did work quite well for a while, right? And then we see that other nations have started to copy that capability uh, and actually use it against us, and then they found vulnerabilities in our precision strike complex, like, you know, our ability to do ISR, our ability to share communications, right? Uh, and so they started targeting those weak uh, vulnerabilities in our systems. Um, now, on the bottom one, this is not a strategy that we used. It was one that was used against us. Uh, improvised explosive devices in Iraq and Afghanistan, um, they're used by basically a ragtag group of uh, you know, insurgents and terrorists. Um, and this is at the tactical level, but it proved to be highly effective for them. Uh, for you know, $100 or less, they could put together an IED uh, and what does that cause us to do? It greatly restricts our freedom of movement in the theater. Um, it makes us look like we're ineffective uh, to the local population, further undermining our efforts. Uh, and ultimately, I point out here that just in the period from 2006 to 2011, we ended up spending about $58 billion on technologies designed to counter these IEDs that cost just hundreds of dollars each. Um, so, you know, what I gained from you know, this review of asymmetries in previous military strategies uh, is that it's not always uh, an asymmetric advantage that will be enduring, right? In many cases, these are transient advantages, um, and your opponent is going to be an active thinking uh, opponent, and they're going to try to find ways uh, to counteract what you're doing. So this leads me then to you know, kind of the core of the paper, uh, which is a framework for evaluating asymmetries, right? And uh, there are five different questions that I think you need to explore uh, to fully understand you know, how enduring and how advantageous an asymmetry might be. Uh, the first two questions that you see here, they really look at endurance. Uh, how likely are you able to maintain this asymmetric advantage? The third and fourth questions really get to the degree of leverage it's going to provide. How much can you maximize leverage using this asymmetry? And the fifth one really tells you how much can you scale this? Can you go exponential with this? Uh, or is this something that as you try to scale it, it will eventually peter out? Uh, so I then in the paper, I apply that framework. I pick three areas that I, I found to be of interest. Uh, I won't go into a, a lot of detail uh, on each of these, uh, but I went through and tried to apply that framework to ubiquitous ISR. Uh, that was the first one. That is the idea uh, that we're deploying so many sensors uh, in space, in the air, terrestrial layer sensors, uh, that we're getting to a point where you can kind of have visibility into what's happening everywhere, you know, everything all at once, isn't that a movie title or something, all right? <laughs> um, but you can kind of see everything that's going on to a certain degree in the environment around you. The asymmetric advantage that that can create uh, is that a nation that's trying to conceal something, either conceal what's going on within its own borders or what it's doing outside of its own borders, may no longer be able to do so, right? Um, and so, you know, I go through then and evaluate, you know, the immutability uh, of that, the uh, fundamental source uh, of that asymmetry, uh, look at the ability of an adversary to copy or counter it, um, the level of effect at which it operates, you know, this is really more anchored at the tactical level, giving you near real-time uh, ISR. 
Uh, does it leverage synergies with other uh, underlying asymmetries that are at work? Uh, and what about its ability to scale? Um, I also looked at hypersonic weapons. This is one that you know gets a lot of attention, right? Uh, that you know folks have said, "Hey, we're falling behind in hypersonic weapons. China and Russia are making advances in them. We're not. Um, you know, so we need to catch up uh, so that we don't have this." you know, asymmetric disadvantage when it comes to hypersonic weapons. Uh, but that's another one to kind of, you know, really track through and say, okay, how much of an asymmetric advantage are hypersonic weapons? Um, is that an advantage that's likely to endure uh, for our adversaries or for us? Uh, is it something that can be copied or countered? Um, you know, what level of effect is that giving you leverage? Um, you know, does it work with other asymmetries? And in this case, I think it does, uh, you know, leverage geography to a certain extent. If you need to hit, you know, highly defended time sensitive targets at range, um, you know, and what's your ability to scale, right? Um, and the last one I looked at in the paper is commercial innovation, right? And this is another one that gets talked about a lot. Uh, you know, what are, you know, what is the Department of Defense doing to leverage all of the innovation that's coming out of our private sector, commercial companies with dual use type technology? Uh, and, you know, this is one where when you really dig at that, what is the source of that asymmetry and in commercial innovation? Ultimately, it's our free society, uh, it's our free market economic system, it's our access to capital. Right, that is where commercial innovation comes from. Those are things that are largely immutable. I won't say perfectly immutable, uh, because as we hear the, the debates going on in DC about potentially defaulting on our national debt, we could certainly undermine this quite a bit if we chose to. Um, but these are things that are not likely to change overnight, right? Um, and it's also something where our adversaries, and here I'm thinking Russia, China, let's throw in Iran, North Korea, um, they don't have that same advantage, right? And they're not likely to get it anytime soon. And in fact, if they did, if they actually wanted to copy us and create a commercial innovation uh, sector of their own that they could leverage for defense, for them to really copy us and compete with us on commercial innovation, they would have to become like us. Uh, and so that's not such a bad proposition then, right? Um, then they're probably not that much of an adversary if they were a free society, open markets, uh, you know, uh, that, that would change the game altogether. Um, so I am gonna stop there in the interest of time for, uh, to get to our panelists uh, and hear their thoughts on these issues. Um, so, and then after we go, I'm going to give each panelist uh, time to make their own opening remarks and, and comments on the paper and their own thoughts about asymmetries um, and, uh, you know, enduring advantage they can provide. Uh, and then we'll open it up to the audience uh, for question and answer. So, awesome. JJ, why don't we start with you? Great. Thanks so much, Todd. And thanks for having me as part of this conversation. This is something I'm really passionate about. And a big thank you to Naval Postgraduate School for hosting us today. Um, so my background is not as an acquisition officer. I was a 20-year career intelligence officer. So I worked uh, extensively in counterproliferation, so a lot of deep tech and science-y stuff. But my last seven years, I did spend in the innovation space. So CIO for Softworks, CTO for AFWorks, um, a lot of public and private sector collaboration, so one foot on each side of that fence, and learned a lot in the process. Uh, what I love about uh, Todd's paper, and if you haven't read it, dig on that paper. There are a lot of great nuggets in there. There are a bunch of threads we can pull to grant asymmetric advantage to our acquisitions teams and our innovation hubs. Um, Three that jumped out to me right away uh, as I was going through the paper, and, and this is specific to the technology and the commercial part, were leveraging our asymmetric advantage, which Todd touched on this already. It's the American people. And I saw this firsthand. The American people as an idea factory uh, within our innovation hubs, providing them friendly front doors that they can engage through to us is huge. Um, at Softworks, at Afworks, we had prize challenges, we had hackathons. Uh, we often would have over the horizon events where we would bring in people with deep experience in specific sectors 
to identify risks and opportunities, but also within those spaces to highlight um, how we could move faster, different things we could do better. Uh, some of the venture capital and private equity conversations we had really looked at how do we co-invest in meaningful ways. So I would love to see more access in that area and bringing in those bright ideas, opening the aperture on what's possible. Um, in some of the situations, we had people as young as 13 with great ideas and we had people as old as 89. And it helped us to get to the solutions that we were after faster and we moved in a way that uh, was more impactful and more efficient and at the end of each one of those events, the results were often surprising in their simplicity uh, in, in what we had accomplished. The second area that I'm very passionate about is investing in startups. I think we're doing a great job with OTAs, SBIRs, STTRs, I love all of those vehicles. But recently in a conversation with some private sector friends, they said, hey, why aren't you using performance-based contracting as a mechanism for both screening and investment? And I got excited about this. It was actually a pretty cool idea. So if you have a stakeholder that has a specific set of requirements, they set those out to the public. These startups come in and they pitch their idea. And the stakeholder says, I like that, that idea. I like that company, the team, the tech, and the concept makes sense to me. I'm going to put 5% down on that and have them build a proof of concept. They build the proof of concept and they successfully demonstrate that concept. When they do that, they get 45% more funding. Now that allows them to commercialize the concept. At that point, you begin to apply those other vehicles, the OTAs, SBIRs, STTRs, because not only do you have a stakeholder that is agreeing that they have met successfully those requirements, but at the same time, you're flagging to the private sector, hey, we are now becoming a client or a customer for this specific product and that last 50% of the performance-based contract is all about acquiring that specific capability for the stakeholders. So this was a great idea, I absolutely love it, and I feel like it will help us to better focus those vehicles as well as to move faster with the right companies and the right teams that are demonstrating performance and, and success in those uh, specific areas where we need the most. The final area, Huge fan of generative AI. I was part of an event uh, last weekend in New York working with some big names, Prudential, AIG, uh, some big banks, Wells Fargo, uh, JP Morgan Chase. They are leveraging generative AI in ways that I haven't seen before. And the transformational power of these tools, if we can get it into our innovation hubs and bring it alongside our acquisition experts, will be tremendous. Um, in the ways that they're finding efficiencies, producing new ideas, and modifying, evolving their policy, regulation, and legislation blew me away. I tried it myself last weekend. I dropped the FAR, all 2,038 pages of it, into uh, a generative AI, and I asked it to do several things. I said, uh, can you put this in plain language for me? Can you ensure you keep all of the regulatory aspects uh, in place? Can you make it 50 pages? <laughs> it worked. Here's what I will tell you. I wouldn't use it out the gate, but I, run it by legal, run it by acquisitions. But if I am now an ally to the acquisition team, which I was at SOCOM and I was at AFWorks, I can understand that document. I can understand the roles I can play to help the acquisition executive uh, in achieving their requirements for the warfighter. Those new acquisition professionals that are coming in now have a document that gives them the basics that they need to operate successfully, to move fast, and to have a tremendous impact. And I feel like when you combine all three of these threads, you get that asymmetric advantage that will get the technology we need today to the warfighter and proactively get the te technologies that we need for the future before point of need. All right, I've said enough. I'm really excited about this panel. It's great to be here. All right, Jackie. Well, I'll echo the sentiments. Thank you so much for inviting me to um, comment on a truly fascinating um, paper and to be here. Um, it's my first time here at this symposium and it's been fascinating. Um, so I want to talk with kind of the core concepts of the paper and then bring it back to um, some of the, the work I've been doing lately. Um, so what is the asymmetry? 
uh, this idea of asymmetric advantage, even though Todd brought up the most recent strategy, has really been something that has dominated U.S. strategic thinking, um, you know, potentially back to the beginning of the Cold War, um, and in the last 20 to 30 years has really focused on technological advantage. And so this idea of asymmetry, uh, you can see it in other terms. I'll say something which I know it's going to give some people in the room shudders, but in revolutions in military affairs, <laughs> the offset, and um, these are all kind of derivatives of the same core theoretical concept, which is how do we create advantage? Now, the reality is that no two states are actually ever strictly symmetrical. So sometimes in our quest for asymmetry, we're, we're not really um, looking at where the extent of asymmetry can occur. So you know, no states are ever truly symmetric in terms of geography, will, governance, industrial capability, even strictly equal military capabilities can be used with asymmetric advantage. And so when we're talking about asymmetric advantage as a concept, sometimes it's hard for us to think about the difference between tactical asymmetric advantage and strategic asymmetric advantage. And Todd does a good job of laying out five questions that help us kind of parse out what are these kind of smaller advantages from the strategic, but I'm going to say you could, you could probably make it even broader. And, and get rid of five questions, you have two. And the two <laughs> questions are, how long can you keep the advantage? And to what extent does the asymmetry create an advantage? And those are the two core concepts, right? And all the other kind of questions kind of nest underneath that. So I'm going to say that for the US, we have focused potentially too much on temporary asymmetries um, and not enough on longer asymmetries. And the reason for this is because our theory of victory has a relatively small time frame for status quo. So we have these biological examples, and the reality is that you get this tit for tat in terms of asymmetry until species reach a relative status quo. But that status quo can be a short period of time or a long period of time. My argument would be that a lot of what the U.S. is focused on has been extremely short periods of competition. And that has led us to focus on tactical, technological asymmetries instead of more strategic asymmetries. And I'm going to argue that the primary way in which you create a strategic asymmetry, which in the language of the revolutions in military affairs, this is the difference between a RMA and a military revolution, is that an RMA, or a short-term asymmetric advantage, can create tactical or changes on the battlefield but are quick to be adapted to. But that in long-term conflict, conflict that lasts over even a few months, true asymmetry occurs when a state is able to, to make a change that changes the way they can sustain the political or economic cost of warfare. And in the end, it's how these variables impact the cost, the ability of a society to continue to fight that war that end up leading to asymmetric strategic advantage. And I think, I, I will say, I think in this sense, we have failed at least in the last uh, 20 to 30 years. You know, we've been focusing on kind of short-term asymmetric advantage by doubling down on the advances that you highlighted, advances in computing, stealth technology, sensors. And the idea with that was that this would create the smaller, higher quality US military that could avoid large wars and costly wars of attrition, the long-term status quo, and also preserve the political will to support an all-volunteer post-Vietnam force. That hasn't worked. Um, and I think if you look at especially kind of the transformation, another word, asymmetric advantage, RMA, military transformation, that Rumsfeld was advocating for in 2001, you'll see that the smaller, more high-tech arsenal that he believed would have an asymmetric advantage ended up not being able to survive against or, or ultimately lead to strategic victory when compared to the asymmetric, um, the asymmetric variable of will that was occurring in the Taliban and Afghanistan. So in the meantime, what we've been doing is we're investing in, I think this is an important conversation for this room, we have been investing in high-tech, expensive wars with the idea that we can create 
small term status quo that we have a large asymmetric advantage in. Um, but that's probably not the future. And what we've ended up with um, is a bureaucratic process that and the next desire the desire for the next big thing which can't doesn't work well with the bureaucratic process which has led us to um, more and more expensive things at a smaller a smaller quantity and what we end up with is this paradox where chasing emerging technologies has made weapons so expensive that no qualitative upgrade can make up for the decline in the quantity so that leaves us with an arsenal, that arsenal that's neither good enough nor large enough for asymmetric advantage in anything bigger than short wars of coercion. Uh, I don't have a great solution for this, but I would say that I think when we're talking to an audience like this, we can tend to get focused on the next cool thing, the AI the quantum computing, the hypersonics, and thinking about how it builds technical advantages. But until the DOD, this community, our government can figure out a better way of doing the processes by which it acquires these technologies and sustains these technologies and decreases the overall economic cost, we will not be able to have a long-term strategic asymmetry. Excellent thoughts. Uh, I had to take some notes there. Um, Derek, over to you. Well, Todd, Jackie just took your five questions and put them through the AI machine in her head and distilled <laughs> it down to two. So there you go. You know, how long does it last and, uh, and how big a deal is it, basically, is it the, the advantages? No, so this is, this is, uh, this is important to think about. And, and I'm, I'm going to to pull the thread on, on a lot of the things you said, Jack, because I, I agree, I agree with those a lot. Um, you know, your your paper in reading through it, uh, I'll tell you that the biology part I, I skipped over because that's the kind of guy I am. But uh, when I, when I heard you brief it here, I got I actually it actually inspired me, and it because I'm not a theoretical guy, but I did start out uh, my physics research when I was an undergrad was in uh, this thing called CP violation, which is a Asymmetry. So it, at the Big Bang, you have equal. You have energy that converts into into matter, right? But it, every time you do the experiment, you get equal amounts of matter and antimatter, and so they just collide back together and form energy. And so you would see, you shouldn't have any matter. So there's, the theory was there is some little asymmetry in the beginning, and and so there's a lot of so it's it's fascinating if you if you think about that. Okay, the asymmetry asymmetry across this the scales is pretty impressive, but. Um, how does that apply to, to, you know, I'm not a theoretical guy, so I say, well, how does that apply to, you know, the, how, I, how I win a war? And so that's, that's the whole focus of the Space Development Agency, just to kind of put it in context of what, of what we're doing at the Space Development Agency. We're focused on creating advantages in space, and we were established in 2019 primarily to capitalize on what was done in the commercial space industry and be able to pull that into the military space, be able to field capabilities as rapidly as possible. And we do that based on two main pillars. So pillar number one is proliferation, right? We want to get out of this model uh, away from the large exquisite spacecraft and get into these models where you, where you can proliferate and you can do it very quickly. And that's where pillar number two comes out. And pillar number two is spiral development. And that is actually more profound than the proliferated aspect. And, uh, and the reason it is, is it goes into this, it goes into this how can you do things as quickly? As, as Jackie was mentioning, how do you, you make sure that you can make changes quickly uh, so you want to make sure it's affordable so you don't kind of get into this path where you're locked in. And that actually forces us within SDA, we have, a, we have an unofficial motto. Our official motto is Semper Sidious, which means always faster, but the unofficial motto is better is the enemy of good enough. You got to get to that part that is just good enough that you can do in the next two years and then spiral up from there. So that's what we're focused on. We're focused on getting capabilities out as rapidly as possible based on what has already been developed and commoditized by commercial industry and then we just modify it slightly to make it work in a military relevant environment. And primarily we're focused on two capabilities beyond line of sight targeting of time sensitive targets. Think about the precision guided munitions. How do we extend that and, and basically keep that, keep that advantage? Uh, with, with going beyond the line of sight in contested environments so you get rid of the A2AD environment. And then the other one is the exact same. You want to be able to detect, 
track, moving targets. Now I want to be able to detect and track hypersonic glide vehicles or advanced missiles in flight. And so that, that kind of closes, closes it all out. You take precision guided munitions and you, you match them with how you do defense against hypersonic uh, missiles. So that, that's what we're focused on, being able to get those into the hands of the warfighter as, as rapidly as possible. And so one of the, one of the, the key things that, that I, I took away from the paper and, and wanted to internalize and, and make sure that, that you all recognized is that uh, you know, we, we, can, we can look at this in the department and we can say, you know, commercial innovation is doing great things, and they are. And as Todd mentioned, we as a government could screw that up, but uh, what can we control within the Department of Defense in how we do acquisition? One of the things is we have to look at if commercial, if we all look to commercial innovation and say that is the model, how can we make sure that we don't look completely different than industry inside the Department of Defense? And so that's, that's my whole viewpoint when I look at acquisition within the Department of Defense. I haven't read the full 2,000 pages of the FAR, but I'd love to read the 50-page distilled version. But, uh, you know, my, my experience base, I was in industry uh, for, for many years before uh, coming uh, into the government in this role to be able to do acquisition. And so when I came in, I saw that there were some things that were just fundamentally broken. And, and look at them and you say, does anybody really take a step back and ask themselves how this happened? Well, so why is commercial innovation something that everyone within the department looks to and why does it give us this advantage? I would say that uh, primarily it's because we, we take a market approach in, in, the, in the commercial industry. And you try a lot of different things. Some people will fail, some people will succeed, and you'll continue to push forward and you'll get the best of, of breed. The other approach, of course, is centrally planned. And you have people that, that are smarter than everyone else and they make the decisions and they push forward and, and that's, that's the decision and they, the dictates and that's what you design and move forward. And we all know as Americans that Essentially planned items typically are not as efficient as market driven. I mean, that's kind of why we have this, this advantage in the U.S. versus, uh, versus centrally planned economies and governments that, uh, that we now view as our adversaries. And obviously, I, I'm way out of school talking next to a Hoover Institute uh, person I'm next to this, but, but that's, that's my understanding. That's my uh, 50 cent version of, of economics. But that, if you look at, that's what happens in the Department of Defense. So in the Department of Defense, the entire way we do acquisition was designed with the 60s model that you have. You have a monolithic weapon system. You have a weapon system that does its own, you know, it, it does its own detection, it does its own uh, calibration, it does its own fire control, and there's an entire system that's built up and that's treated as one monolithic unit. F-35 is a good example of that, right? It does all its own sensing, all its own fire control, and of course it has supporting infrastructure that spreads out, but really it's all centrally controlled and planned. Aegis weapon systems on ships is another one. That's not the way the future is going, and that's all centrally planned. The future is going to a disaggregated system where you have different systems that are doing real-time sensing, feeding data to weapons platforms that are then uh, doing fire control, and then they can be uh, releasing a weapons off of a, a third uh, different platform. And all of those are not centrally managed or controlled. They are essentially disaggregated, and those functions exist in the ether. That's the whole vision of JADC2 in the future. So if that's really what we want to get to, you have to say, is that going to be enabled by the centrally managed and centrally controlled way we do acquisition? If we want our weapons platforms and systems to not be centrally managed, how do we expect to buy that with a centrally managed acquisition system? What's a centrally managed acquisition system look like? It looks like a, an acquisition system where I, I go out there and I look, uh, I, I'll take some technologies that I think are good, I'll take them through prototypes, and then I'll, I'll down select, and then I'll go into maybe a low rate initial production, maybe I'll down select again, or maybe I'll just go into a full production run. That's centrally managed. That says that at the very early stage, I chose the winner or set of winners, and that's what I'm going to go with and, and push forward. And that's, that's what you were hitting on, Jackie, is that's what's not going to allow us to respond quickly, because you essentially have too much investment in it at that point. So the future, what we're trying to do at SDA is make that completely open two-year acquisition cycles where we look out and we say we're going to do full and open competition. So the only thing we have to essentially get 
somewhat right at the beginning is the interfaces between them so that vendor A and vendor B can feel empowered that they can develop set, uh, technologies and solutions and they can continue to plug into the overall architecture. But once you do that, then essentially you step back and you let the commercial innovation take over and push it forward. That's going to, that's going to, to send a different message to industry that they need to push forward and they need to invest because there's a market out there, not a centrally planned unit where they look at it as program by program acquisition, but they view it as a market that they can invest and then have a differentiator for their offering in that market. Different view. We have to look at that differently within the department. We have to say, okay, we are no longer buying a set of pro, we're not, we're not buying on a program by program basis that goes through development and then act production and then acquisition, or excuse me, then operations and sustainment. No, we have to say we are going to just support a market that provides capabilities, and those capabilities can come from all different solutions. They can be commercial, they can be best of breed commercial that the government essentially buys copies of and, and owns, but it's essentially commercial technology, or it can be a mixture of those. But that's completely different. That's not going to follow any of the acquisition models out there, but that's what we need to do to make sure that we can capitalize off of the commercial innovation, which I think is, is the biggest asymmetric advantage that we have as a, as a free nation. And so that's what we're pushing forward within the department, and, uh, and, and that's what we hope industry kind of gets on too. So I think that's a message we all need to communicate. With that, I'll turn it over to Mandy. Sweet. Thanks, Todd. Um, thanks for the invitation for the panel, because I think this is a very timely topic, um, an interesting topic, and, and thank you to NPS for hosting the, the forum here. And I'm a huge Jeopardy fan, so I really only agreed to come to NPS in, in hopes of meeting the famous Professor Sam Buttry, who won the Professor's Tournament and is, is still rolling on the Masters show now. So I didn't watch last night, so don't tell me. Um, so let's see, but we'll start with feedback on, on the paper, and, and I, I thought the fish examples were pretty cool, but anyway. Um, I did too, uh, studied okay. every minute. <laughs> I just love your bluntness, I'm like, I skipped that part. Um, but the, pivoting to the role in the strategic strengths and weaknesses from the geopolitical perspective, I'm wondering if in the paper, uh, if you kind of look at the asymmetries that exist, like. Does the analogy hold when you look at how the animals versus the geopolitical example on um, when they're under threat, right? So how do they react in some of those circumstances? You know, because from the classic animal bio biological perspective, it's the fight or flight. Um, how do the countries react? Because you know, there's are there similar underpinnings in terms of of what we're seeing in different threat spaces now, where depending on the level of, of real or perceived threat or, or dire circumstances within domestic frameworks, how does that change an adversary's possible calculus of what is the tipping point where they would make an external problem a lot more escalatory? So another point with the paper, uh, I really like how you talk about applying the framework across the spectrum of conflict. I think that's really critical. Um, and I think a part of what we don't do well within the acquisition community is really thinking about the same thing, right? Because part of the asymmetries that we can really think about are what can we do differently right now to take advantage of a lower level of constant conflict um, to be ready if there is in the future elevated conflict? Where do we have freedom of maneuver now that might be perishable? So it's an asymmetry that could exist now that may not exist as that elevated conflict um, that state changes. And then another one regarding scale. How, so one question in terms of the acquisition side, whew, how do we measure it, right? So I think that I, one of the parallel panels going on right now was on ROI and how could we possibly measure it. So I think there, there's some, something we need to think about there um, on how could we prove what's working or not. And I'll get to that with the commercial element in a moment. Um, but then, okay, asymmetries that may exist within defense acquisition, and I thought uh, Derek just brought some great points in terms of the basis of SDA and, and how are you exploiting what could be some of those asymmetries. That's awesome. Um, I would also point out that, just to be more blunt about it, our requirements in the PPBE process that ha has been around for, for 60 years, I think, is a distinct asymmetry, but not in our favor. <laughs> so I think it, it's, it's very much... A, a process from the first offset that we're still beholden to. And I love the putting the FAR into the AI machine 
to gonculate out a more digestible thing because there's power in the FAR, there's, there's rules, there's reasons for the rules and the logic, but how do we not get hamstrung in the implementation? So that, I just think that's awesome. Um, so one thing also with the innovation ecosystem and a possible asymmetry. So one thing that uh, the Defense Science Board worked on last summer was kind of reviewing for uh, uh, Ms. Sh the Honorable Heidi Shu, she's USD r &E, on what are the critical technology areas and where do we have possible asymmetries? Where do we have unique things within the US and our allies' te technology base that, that may really be an a asymmetric advantage in the future? And one thing we really kept coming back to is the innovation ecosystem. So the innovation ecosystem unto itself really can be an asymmetric advantage, but the problem here is we've really failed at scaling it so how do we scale the adaptation of the stuff that comes out of that ecosystem and make it operationally really meaningful and part of the DOD's everyday way of doing business? So I think that's an area where, as a department, we really need to think about that. So I think some other areas where this is being poked at and looked at, hopefully with a little bit more sense of urgency, is as Derek's doing with SDA, what are the right acquisition tools at the right time, right? Is it an OTA? I mean, OTA is not a panacea. I just, I get a little irritated with how many people are like, oh, it's OTAs. I'm like, yeah, that's great, but it's, it's not a panacea. It's, it's a great tool at the right time with the right kind of technical baseline and contractor mix. Same thing with, with FAR. Is it PAR 15? Is it FAR Part 12? So it's commerciality, um, public-private partnerships, Cyber sitter, I mean, all of these are weapons that we need to empower our acquisition professionals to really be fluent in how to leverage the right one at the right time um, to move in with, with the right speed for, for what the operator really needs. And I think a lot of that comes into education with the PEOs, right? So it's like, how do we help the program executive officers that are actually responsible for delivering that capability, how do we help them know what is commercially out there? What innovation is happening in the ecosystem? How do we incentivize them to, to care, right? Rather than them being so immersed in the cost schedule performance of their deliverable. So it's like the linkages with, with the softworks and the AFWorks. How do we really get the PEOs to ride side saddle with those portfolio managers in a way that they have to be incentivized to listen? Right, so I think that's a critical area where we can move quickly. Um, so I think there's some, there's a lot of emphasis being looked up at this now. I know from my perspective on the Defense Science Board, we're looking at national security innovation activities and we're looking at commercial space right now as quick as we can to try to implement some of, try to come up with recommendations that can truly be implementable so the department can operationally use this stuff and I say operational with a capital O, of actually make this part of their day-to-day -day plan. I think, what was it, just uh, last week's Space News on the panel that you and Mike Tierney did on terms of Space Force's budget. Yay, it's the biggest it's ever been. And 2% of it is to actually procure commercial, like purely commercial services and data buys. I mean, like, it's a joke, right? So there is a huge asymmetry that we're not leveraging. So I'll stop there. I could go on that one forever. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Uh, so we're going to turn to the Q&A now. So if folks in the room have questions, you can uh, line up at the mic here, um, and we'll call on you. And folks watching online on Zoom, get that Q&A button you can click on. If you enter a question, we'll be able to see it up here, and I'll read it off. Uh, to the other panelists. Um, so, well, folks are getting their questions ready, um, and don't ask us about uh, flatfish or uh, bacteria in cell division. Um, I write about it, but not an expert. Uh, now, I, I, I've got one question uh, for the other panelists, um, is you know, are there other areas that we haven't talked about that weren't in the paper that we haven't talked about yet um, and, you know, not asking you to have fully thought this out yet, but are there other areas of asymmetric advantage where maybe we ought to take another hard look, where maybe it's something we could leverage, maybe it's something that could be leveraged against us that we need to prepare for, uh, or maybe, you know, it's something that people talk about, but maybe they shouldn't. Uh, maybe it's questionable whether or not it really presents the asymmetric advantage people think. Any thoughts? Yeah, I, 
I mean, it's, a lot of this is going to be based on geography. So if you think about um, China, Taiwan, um, I think there's there's a the geography is a strict asymmetrical disadvantage for us, and one of the disadvantages that we have not thought through a lot is the ability to resupply Taiwan. So what does that mean for naval assets in the Pacific? Um, have we thought about merchant marines? Have we thought about um, how we're going to escort? I mean, some of these are core mission sets that we really have not done. But if you look at the beginning of you know, World War I and World War II, a huge portion of that was our ability to resupply Europe from across the Atlantic. And it was also, you know, coincidentally, like part of what brought us into some of these conflicts. So I think that's, um, I think we have not thought enough about the asymmetries, about what it's going to take to be able to resupply uh, across the Pacific. Uh, do you have one? So yeah, that, that's, a, that's a good one, right? The Navy always fights an away game, right? And uh, and that's a, that's a big disadvantage we have. The, the other thing that is, uh, is an advantage for us as a nation, but in, in warfare, it's an asymmetric advantage that could be exploited against us that we need to fold into everything we do, and that is essentially our value of human life is higher than, uh, than, than China's. So when we, when, we look at, when we look at sheer numbers and how we would prosecute a campaign, uh, we, we, have to, we, we have to come to the agreement that we would not be willing to take the number of losses that, that we assume China would be able to. And that means that as we go through our scenarios, we have to place a much bigger emphasis on how we deter with the knowledge that a strike against the, the a, a strike against Taiwan would not allow China to uh, achieve its goals regardless of, of losses because that's a that's a different calculus that they have than, than we may have so that makes us look at things significantly differently and we have to make sure that we can have deterrence and strike capabilities in place that can really make it impossible for China to achieve its goals not just costly and that's a asymmetric disadvantage that we have that we have to be aware of it's a good one all right so I see questions lining up here so yeah. You, oh, you got one. Yeah, Go for I it. I got one. So putting my intelligence officer hat on, we have an information problem. Um, we are focused on internal information almost exclusively. We need to be looking at open source intelligence. That's a severe limitation right now, and we continue to play, pay lip service to it. We need to actually start using it. There are some incredible tools coming online right now that if we don't start using it, our adversaries certainly will. So when we think about information, we need to be thinking about all information. I've brought people in on conversations and had them present in front of an intelligence audience, and I had to tell the intelligence audience ahead of time, hey, the person I'm bringing in has never held a clearance. They don't know that we've classified certain things that we've classified, and they're going to tell you some stuff that's going to freak you out. Don't say anything. Be cool. And then the person reveals, hey, we did this, this, and this, and I use these tools online, and everybody goes, oh, that's a problem. We should be talking to people and have an ecosystem in the private sector that we're actively engaging with to get this information so we know what's out there and we don't have any surprises. because. There are a lot of surprises getting ready to happen, especially with all of this generative AI, and we don't want to be caught flat-footed. No, that's a good one. Got to get out of our skiffs and start looking out the window. All right, sir. <laughs> There's no windows in skiffs. Uh, Chris Berardi, I have a question. So, you know, I've spent 18 years doing acquisitions, acquisitions pretty much only, and uh, it's oftentimes we're in these situations where we invite outside perspectives in with people uh, some, some situations like yourself that have never walked a day in our shoes and frequently hear everyone extolling the virtues of the commercial market, right? This is the solution, this is everything where it's at. And I always wonder why we don't see the same type of success in our market when we try that stuff. And it always comes back to me that it's two fundamentally different markets. Like we are one of the only true monopsonies that exist. And it seems to me a little unrealistic to expect us to be able to adopt a monopolistic market structure and the advantages there and just lift it wholesale into a monopsony and then be like, oh, it's going to work. It just doesn't seem like a logical conclusion to me. It's something that we quickly blow past when we have these suggestions. 
So I would ask, is, is that really something that we should expect to happen? And I think that's a rhetorical question because of the way I've set it up. But, <laughs> but how can we use the monopsony as an asymmetric advantage, realizing that that will probably always be the way it is, no matter how much you want to change, there's still going to be only one DOD. But so what is the asymmetric advantage of the monopsony and how do we use that? So other than creating more than one DOD, which don't put it past Congress. That's a fair point. Yeah. Now, any, anyone want to respond? Yeah. I'll take a little bit of that. Um, I think great point, and certainly not every system or DOD use case would be conducive to that. Like F-35s are not necessarily being cranked out of, of commercial plants, right? But a lot of the sensing data that feeds what the F-35 can gonculate on, because that's a technical term, could be, right? Just with different levels of uncertainty or trust associated with that incoming data. And I think like one example in terms of really where, where you're living is ubiquitous comms. Right, ubiquitous ISR you hit on in the paper, but ubiquitous cons, if the whole world is truly connected, um, the DOD isn't a monopoly anymore. Or if they're trying to be a monopoly, they're going to fail. Right, so just the same way that, that you know, my phone might be on the Verizon network, but it can still talk to AT&T. It's like this, the commercial communications infrastructure of what is next after 5G will include space, terrestrial, all domain, and uh, we've got to figure out how the JADC2 construct leverages just what is inherently going to come. So I think from my perspective, the DOD is a monopoly and, and a single customer in many ways, but in others, they're trying to still be a, cus a single customer in an area that doesn't make any sense. And, and I think the, the ISR and the comms are areas where I think it doesn't make sense for them to think like they are a monopolistic customer. It's my two cents. I want to uh, pull the thread on the multiple DODs perspective for a second because I talk, no, 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 and that, that shouldn't, you shouldn't, you don't necessarily need that, but. I brought the multiverse uh, into it. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, you know, as I, as I mentioned, we, we want to get away from centrally planned and get into this, this market driven. One of the things that caused a lot of fireworks within the Department of Defense when SDA was established is SDA made no, uh, made no apologies that we were there specifically to compete with, at that time, the Air Force and then the Space Force, primarily how they did acquisition and, and Space Systems Command. And there were a lot of people that wanted to put lanes in the road and be able to say, no, 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 SSC will buy these types of systems, SDA will buy these types of systems, Space RCO, Space Rapid Capabilities Office will buy these types of systems, and say, you know, that, that's how they fit together in this overarching, beautiful architecture. And I made no apologies to say, no, we have these capabilities, and each of the acquisition organizations should compete for who has the best idea on how to solve it. And, and you may have to run some of the, those in parallel, and people would look at that and say that's duplicative, maybe, perhaps. Uh, but I look at it and say, no, that's going to drive down the overall price in the end. It'll save us money. It'll give us a better product to make sure we have that competition. So it's a matter of hubris within the department to think that one, one entity can make a determination and say this is the right way to go and then dictate that down and say there's no competition al um, uh, amongst all the other organizations. I think you want to foster that, you want to encourage it, and if that leads to duplication, that's called resilience, and just move forward with it. So you don't need two DODs, but you definitely need a mindset within the DOD that multiple ways to solve the problem and competing those is a good thing, not a bad thing, and that's a different mind shift. So I agree, DOD, not a, a clear analogy to the commercial market. And sometimes our quest to make it like the commercial market leads with an inability to get rid of bad stuff. Um, and I include institutions there. We've built a, I, I can't even keep count of the amount of innovation um, organizations that we've built over the last um, five to six years. And this is not a natural market. So once an institution is built, there are institutional incentives to keep the institution going, which means you end up with excess um, institutions. But I do see some advantages for the, the DOD's problem. And I think the biggest advantage is DOD purchasing power, which means that in the commercial market, there are market failures, right? There are things that are not invested in because they're either high capital, 
high capital, low return, or long return, right? So these are not things that would actually have a commercial, they're not commercially viable, right? They're definitely not, I'm sitting in Silicon Valley, we do a lot of the venture capital meetings. I've been in a lot of these, what we call tech track two, where we've got venture capital and DOD, and you know we're talking past each other. But I mean, how venture capital makes money does not actually always incentivize the kind of firms that would be investing in, in DOD. Um, so DOD can, if used appropriately, use its extraordinary purchasing power to lead the market, to spur investment where capital is otherwise low. Um, and I don't think we think enough about that ability to, to spur it in the other direction. The problem is you have to also then be able to tell companies that they can take that investment and potentially you know, commercialize. Um, and that's somewhere where we haven't been so successful. Go to the Softworks webpage. Look at their impact site. What you'll find there are a series of metrics that are measuring how they're interfacing with both SOCOM and all of the subordinate commands, as well as the private sector, and they're showing you, they've actually listed each project they've invested in, how much, how long it took them to transition it to a program of record, or if they didn't, what they did instead. It's fantastic, and it's a great uh, cornerstone to start building those kinds of relationships to leverage DOD dollars in parallel to what the private sector is investing in. I think you guys have said it so well, I, I won't say anything else. Uh, next questioner. Uh, Jeff Dunlap, uh, Naval Postgraduate School, uh, <coughs> Defense uh, Department of Defense Management. Um, uh, this is a Navy question, uh, and it has to do with uh, asymmetric uh, advantages that disappear over time in the history of it. Uh, if you go back to the battleship, uh, the World War I uh, battleship uh, type of event, to where uh, many in the Navy believed that the battleships were uh, no longer valuable. Uh, and that was sort of the rise of the aircraft carrier. It wasn't until Pearl Harbor that uh, you know, we, we basically lost all the battleships, but uh, the aircraft carrier arose. And we've sort of been on this train of aircraft carriers. Uh, I, I was stationed on the Ronald Reagan for two and a half years as a department head. Um, and, and you start looking at a uh, a, a non-superpower, uh, you know, environment to where nobody can touch an aircraft carrier. Good asymmetric threat. Um, and then as you start looking at China with their uh, carrier buster cruise missile, now hypersonics, and, uh, and now we're spending all our resources on trying to protect the aircraft carrier when we should be doing something different. So my, my question is, is how does the Navy get off of uh, these <laughs> failed asymmetric concepts uh, when we've had uh, um, experience with this before, but now we're building another aircraft carrier uh, and uh, $8.5 billion to build an aircraft carrier is just the tip of the iceberg uh, when you look at the true cost uh, where we could be spending money somewhere else to add uh, an asymmetric threat. All right. Yeah, no, I, so, so I actually, this is one of the things as a, a budget analyst, I you know, like to pour through all the budget documents. I looked at uh, the next Ford class carrier. Uh, it's actually showing up in the, in the fight up now in FY28. Uh, we're gonna buy that. The cost now is 17.3 billion for carrier. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, and, and the previous four classes, they were like 12, 13 billion each. Uh, so it, it's a real head scratcher. Why are we continuing to double down on an investment uh, where we know that the adversary has figured out how to counter it? Uh, they're also trying to copy it, uh, which I kind of like because we know how to counter it too. Uh, and we're actually better at that. Um, you know, we, we'll easily be able to sink their carrier. So I don't know what they think they're doing, but that's great if they want to spend their money on that. But yeah, it does, it does raise the question, right? Have we thought this through? Uh, is this, what's the opportunity cost, but what's the advantage here? Um, and what's the advantage lost if we continue to invest in this way? Uh, and I think in my mind, my opinion, uh, the answer is that it's bureaucracy. It is institutions, organizations within the Navy uh, where the culture has centered around particular types of platforms. 
Uh, and so how do you break away from that type of platform when you have a whole culture of people that is about that? Uh, and that's a very hard, very long-term challenge to do. So, you know, culture can, in fact, be an asymmetric disadvantage for us. You're also dealing with some sunk costs. That's a big challenge to overcome because people will continue to put money into a project even if they see that there's a threat on the horizon. Um, until that threat actually arrives, we normally don't deviate from that path. Uh, one of the things that we've done to help around the innovation hubs at least, uh, and the Naval Tech Bridges were part of this too, we looked at mothball ships and we started to leverage drones against certain aspects of those ships. And you have drones that are not carrying a kinetic payload that fly 175 miles per hour, but if they strike a sensitive surface, it renders that vessel inoperable for three, six, eight months until you can replace radar, whatever it happens to be. I think doing those kinds of exercises early and often highlight the threat and will start to change that mindset. Just one thing to, to kind of tie it back to the, the last question in terms of the DOD's buying power and, and to leverage that to the same point. I mean, I think NASA is a great example of what NASA did to really just say, hey, we are at the end of the day, really stepping out of LEO, low Earth orbit, right? So between commercial cargo, commercial crew, and then eventually commercial space stations, NASA is like, they put a demand signal out there like we are going to retire shuttle and commercial industry is going to take it over. And it was where the, the DOD doesn't quite do, hasn't done the same is in terms of putting that demand signal out there of like, no kidding, we are going to retire something and have a demand signal for commercial to come fill the gap. And um, I think what NASA did was, was a, de a decadal play that has now given us access to space that was really unfathomable 20 years ago and allows NASA to then focus on the things that they really need to, which are the webs of the world and things like that. So I think it's definitely a cultural thing, but can go back to that where do we need to put the placard down of, of what is the DOD's ability to create a good demand signal and spurn the innovation to change. So can I take your question and then direct it to Derek and, and phrase it a different way? Is not what the Space Development Agency is doing with proliferated LEO architecture for transport, for missile sensing, is that not displacing the aircraft carrier in, that has been in the Space Force? That is the big, juicy targets <laughs> in geostationary orbit that have done these same missions traditionally? Th that, that's yeah. exactly exactly right. I, you know, I, I thought you were just going to call on me because a former submariner to bash on aircraft carriers, but <laughs> but but no, uh, yeah. I mean, that's that's uh, that's what we're trying to do is, and and I think the Space Force has uh, has has concurred with that now. That that whole architecture that, you know, there there's some aspects of the the geo missions are, that will will always exist, but the shift in the architecture to get out of that mindset and get away from those big juicy targets and get into this proliferated model, Space Force has moved forward. Now the, the reason it was easier for the Space Force than it is for the Navy uh, is, 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 is for several reasons. One, um, there's not the same people that are building the proliferated LEO systems are going to be a lot of the same people that are building the big uh, bespoke systems. Not the case in the big ship builders. So, not, so you have you have congressional limitations and a lot of uh, a lot of uh, lobbying on that aspect that that the space force didn't have to deal with as much. So there's there's that, and then it is the you know just the the enormity of it. Like you said, 17. But how many over how many years is that? So that's one ship. It'll be it'll be spread out over like five six years. Yeah. So to put that in perspective, right, that's roughly 20% of the Space Force budget a year then that's going into one ship. Yeah. So, so that, that's kind of the enormity of it and, and why, you know, obviously the bigger ship you have, the harder it is to turn. So the Space Force was, was able to make that, <laughs> ship easy, make that shift easier. I mean, the Space Force also doesn't have an embedded identity yet. Right. But so much of the, the, the Navy coming out of World War II is tied to the tribe, the, the surface warfare officer, the, the pilots. 
and that is an extremely, extremely difficult identity to overcome. Whereas the Space Force, for all its faults, is extremely malleable right now in terms of its identity. And that, that can allow it to be a little bit more innovative when it comes to platforms that other services have kind of already tied their identity to. Sir? Daisha Pramana from Indonesian Navy, currently study at NPS. I have a question for Mr. Todd Harrison. As you said earlier in the previous paper that there is an example of the ISR or intelligence surveillance and reconnaissance asset that almost the other country have it uh, with the same capability. But in your last, last year paper, I read about the rethinking the role of remotely crew system in the future force. You mentioned that uh, unlocking the full potential of remotely crewed system is a matter of policy. Uh, my question, uh, what about in the US itself, there are two different approaches of the training for the operator of the RPA. One approach requiring the officer and have a uh, experience in flying a real aircraft and another approach is uh, using an only enlisted member and having no uh, flying experience. And both of the service has different budget and different time allocation and also almost the similar uh, mission objective achievement uh, how how do you see that and which one approaches is more relevant to the having a asymmetric advantage thank you yeah no well so uh kudos for braving your way through a prior paper <laughs> of mine um but yeah so there we have differences in the way that we treat the airborne isr enterprise within dod i mean and you look at the way like you you know pointed out there the way that we um you know crew the the rpas within the air force it's officers they've had some experiments in using enlisted um, you know, being pilots, but it is still almost entirely officers. Whereas you look at the Army flying largely the same platforms, uh, and they've used uh, warrant officers and enlisted personnel uh, to be crews for those. Uh, and so, you know, I, I've talked to people in the aviation community, and they point out there are some differences in terms of the ranges over which they operate, but they're fundamentally the same platforms. Um, why is that, right? And what it ends up leading to uh, is a more costly enterprise overall on the labor side, uh, which is a huge cost component for operating any aircraft uh, is labor, not just the crews, but the maintainers and everything. Um, we've got a rigid system uh, on both sides, Army, Air Force, you know, uh, Navy is probably, you know, uh, guilty of this as well. Uh, where we think it's got to be you know, certain levels of people, certain ranks of people, certain experience to, to do certain functions, rather than actually going out and testing and saying, hey, could you achieve the same level of effect, the same level of reliability, you know, et cetera, uh, if you use people at different ranks and different grades, um, where's the sweet spot, right? And we don't go out and experiment too much with that. Uh, we just lock ourselves in into certain numbers at certain levels. Uh, and so we lock ourselves into a cost structure that over time uh, is not an advantage to us because the fact is our labor costs, our personnel costs are far higher uh, than our adversaries and nearly every other military out there. Uh, our people are expensive. They're also our most valuable resource. That's why they're so expensive. Um, but yeah, then that becomes, you know, a disadvantage for us and potentially an asymmetric advantage for others that are more willing to experiment and evolve and adapt in the way that they use their personnel. Um, I don't know if you folks had thoughts about it. I mean, if you look at what Ukraine is doing, it's the exact opposite, right? So Ukraine is trying to use unmanned systems drones of various levels in a very tactical way in which they're able to use multiple or in, in very different types of mission sets. So they're trying to minimize both the logistical tail and the man-for-man -man manpower of the systems. Another question? Hello. Um, it seems to me that, Brian Gladstone from Ida, it seems to me that every strategic and tactical asymmetry has always been temporary throughout history. That's number one. Number two, we're really getting into a moral question here about how much asymmetry is enough 
Uh, you can go all the way to annihilation of your enemy, attacking first, knock him back to, you know, 2,000 years before BC, or you can move all the way up to a level of just deterrence. What do we define as a win? And I would argue that what has kept this country safe and uh, ahead for 200 years has been our ability to innovate and to deter for a large part. So I would ask you all, how can we um, uh, ensure that we keep ahead in innovation and thought uh, to keep us ahead of all of our uh, adversaries and uh, deter uh, another big war. Who wants to jump in? I'll jump in. So that's an awesome question. Um, one of the things that I'm seeing right now in the private sector is a lot of parallel efforts where the private sector has realized that the government is falling short and they're innovating on their behalf. Um, Matreya has done this. Uh, I don't know if you are aware of their aerial refueling program with their Navy tankers. Uh, that's the first time we've refueled, I think April 24th was the first refueling that we've done of a, a couple of P8s. Um, they saw an opportunity and a need. They identified the risks. They realized that hey, we can respond to this with the infrastructure, the aircraft, and the pilots, and we can solve a problem that the Navy has, but also that the whole DOD, NATO, and other countries, UK included, um, have. You're going to see more of this happening in the private sector. They are capitalizing on the opportunity space, and when they see that the government can't achieve in that opportunity space, they're going to step into that, that um, gap. That gives me a lot of hope. The other thing I would say, we need to be looking at those visas that allow us to bring in top talent internationally. There are some incredibly bright minds out there. We need to be welcoming those people in, having them at our universities, celebrating that intellect and getting them into our government programs, our research labs. That's something I, I really, really believe in and we need to do more of it. Thank you. <laughs> I I would add one thought here is that our JSIDS process, how we do requirements uh, and PPBE as part of that, how we actually you know, develop programs and fund them, um, it does not really work any faster than about 10 to 15 years per generation, right? It just doesn't. Um, it's very hard to find workarounds within that where you can innovate faster than that um, it's just not designed for it. Now, I'll say I think SDA is an exception, right, that proves the rule that, that this is the, not the normal uh, way that the system is used. And just the budgeting process itself, um, by the time you've got an idea and you can convince people in the Pentagon, let's put money on it, uh, you put it in your palm, goes into the PB, gets submitted to Congress, Congress, you know, reviews it, uh, acts on it, and, you know, in authorizations and appropriations. That's about a two-year process between when you had the idea and when you actually get an appropriation and an authorization to go do something. Um, two years, like, you are now in many areas of technology, you're now at least a generation behind. <laughs> right? So we've got to get out of this cycle where it's a requirements-based approach, where the government tries to say, this is what I want, this is how it will work, these are the specifications, uh, and this is how much it will cost, how much I'll pay. we got to get into an approach that is much more effects-based, right, rather than requirements-based, and just say, hey, this is the effect I need to generate in the battle space. Um, I'm going to put money towards figuring out ways solutions to deliver that effect, um, and we'll see what industry comes back with, right? And then industry can innovate within that cycle and can continue to innovate if it's effects-based. If it's requirements-based and you're telling industry, I need this built to this, right? You've wiped out innovation there, at least a lot of the innovation that comes from the commercial sector. What you're gonna get is a, a snapshot in time of what they're capable of doing that meets your requirements. So I would say, first, deterrence has failed for the United States many times in the last 200 years. Where we have been successful is deterring invasions, generally, of the continental mainland, but that's largely an asymmetric advantage of geography. 
Where I think we're going now is that the last 20 to 30 years, we've relied on deterrence based on overwhelming technological advantage. The idea that we can threaten with overwhelming um, uh, force and, and short conflicts that the US would be willing to uh, support. That credibility is decreasing. And I would say that post-Ukraine deterrence, especially looking at China, is going to be about the United States being able to credibly signal that we can withstand over a long period of time. And that means an investment in resilience, readiness, munitions, um, and uh, potentially some discussions about basing. All right, I think we are over our time here. <laughs> All right, so uh, sorry we didn't get to the final questions here, um, but please join me in thanking all the panelists for joining us today, it's a great discussion. All right, thank you all.